Thanks, Tom. We're going to be in Acts chapter 15 today. Acts chapter 15. Last week in chapter 14, we ended by saying, Upon the arrival in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything God had done through them, how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they stayed there with the believers for a long time. Then I added, and they lived happily ever after. Because <laughs> that's kind of like where I'd like the story to end, because they were on, they finished their first missionary journey, the gospel had been opened to all the Gentiles, and everyone were, was in one accord. And then kind of the operative answer or the operative word in Acts is but. And, and we're seeing a back and forth. We see that the spreading of the gospel around the world is a messy thing. It's a messy thing because people are involved in sin is a messy thing. And so what we're going to talk about today is there are some people that come into a church, come into religion, and they hear about people being converted, and they say, okay, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's great. It's a good start, but there's more to it than that. And so we see in chapter 15, verse 1, it says, While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised, as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way to Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, they told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. So after the gospel had been taught and people were growing in the Lord, some guys came from Judea, and we're going to find out later that they came under the authority of the Judean church, the church in Jerusalem, saying, oh, we're from Jerusalem, and we're here to you know, tighten things up for you all. You have to be circumcised to be saved. And it says, um, Luke says, there was no small dispute, which means there was a really large dispute. <laughs> they disputed them to their face. They argued vehemently, but they wanted to put the thing to bed, so they said, let's send delegates to Jerusalem and get this thing squared away. Because the idea that salvation comes through grace alone, faith alone, by scripture alone, is something that's very controversial. Everybody likes to go, mm, <clears throat> nice start, let's... Wait a minute, what about discipleship? Wait a minute, did you fully repent? Wait a minute, are you going to church? Did you pray? Are you giving your money? Are you So they attach a lot of things to salvation. And if you could just attach Judaism, like put Christianity under some sort of subset of Judaism, that's all it would have been. But this is a breakout thing. It's saying the Gentiles, the people who are not Jews, don't have to become Jews to be saved. They can just accept Christ as their Savior. And I, again, I wish that this were um, settled for all time. And I'm going to tell you something. I think that we're still fighting the same battle today. Whether it be denominations or non-denominations. There are many non-denominations. People say, well, the answer is no denominations. I can tell you there's a lot of non-denominational churches out there who are adding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Adding to the gospel of Jesus Christ is... Legalism. And a lot of times people throw around the word legalism when someone says, like if um, I once time I heard a guy, he, his uh, daughter told him, Dad, you told me you'd do this at such and such a time. And you didn't, so I think you're wrong. He goes, oh, you're a legalist. It's like, what? No, legalism is saying you have to do something else besides put your faith in Jesus to be saved. That's not, legalism isn't saying that's honest or dishonest. Legalism is adding or subtracting to the cross. And liberals will subtract from the cross. They'll take things away from the Bible. Um, people who are pharisaical or legalistic will add things to the Bible. Jesus plus anything or Jesus minus anything isn't Jesus at all. Amen. And grace that you have to earn isn't grace anymore. It's like saying, what about a gift you have to pay for? Somebody said, I never paid for any gifts. And I'm like, I sure did. I used to give my kids money for Christmas so they could go buy presents. <laughs> give them a lot. Here, here's a lot of money. Go buy your dad a good present. <laughs> no, but you don't pay for presents, do you? Like, can you imagine if um, 
You ladies out there, if your husband came and brought you a dozen roses and you write him a check for 20 bucks, that would, that would defeat the whole purpose, wouldn't it? It'd be funny, like, you know, like a guy takes you out on a date, at the end of the date, you give him a gift card of 50 bucks. A gift isn't a gift if you pay for it. And salvation is free, is a free gift of God. So none of us can go around with our chest pumped up going, what a good boy I am. Look at me, I figured it out, I'm saved. It says, by grace you're saved through faith. And that, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone can boast. Even the faith that you have to believe is given to you by God. Did you know that? So nobody can take credit for it. So these guys are going to Jerusalem to figure it out. It says, when they arrived in Jerusalem, in verse 4, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted that the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. Now I want you to notice something about these guys. These are believers. Just because someone's a believer doesn't mean you can believe everything they say. Did you know some believers are wrong? <laughs> Did you know that? Did you know I'm wrong sometimes? Don't tell my wife. <laughs> no, we're all wrong about some things. I wish I knew which things I were wrong about, then I'd change my mind and be right. <laughs> so you can be wrong about something, and Christians can be wrong about something, and some Christians will lay a trip on you and say, there's more to it than just accepting Christ. Now you can do more after you've accepted Christ, but that doesn't make you saved or unsaved. You're operating from fellowship with Jesus Christ and not for fellowship. You're operating from victory, not for victory. That thing's been settled. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, it's not something you decided just with your mind. You decided, you accepted with your heart, and He changed you forever. He transformed you. He used the word, you must be born again. He said that to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was like, what do you mean born again? What am I going to do, go back inside my mom and get born again? So he's a grown man asking Jesus this. And Jesus said, I'm talking about spiritual rebirth. Because you are dead in your trespasses and sin if you've never accepted Christ. You're dead in your trespasses and sin, and you are headed for hell. Accepting Christ means he forgives you your sins. You accept that free gift of decision. You don't earn it. I've known people who have heard this message and went, I need to walk that aisle and say this prayer, and then I'll be saved. And the walking the aisle and the saying of the prayer was their first two works toward salvation. Do you see how you could miss heaven by between by 16 inches between your head and your heart? Being saved, having salvation, being born again, is God supernaturally redeeming your spirit. Not, I've decided these three things are right and these three things are wrong. It's not an intellectual pursuit. Like I said, your mind is obviously involved. But it is a supernatural, born-again experience. You're born into the kingdom of God. And these people are trying to, they're looking at the Bible. And Jesus said, they asked him, did you come to destroy the law? He said, no, I came to fulfill the law. Right? So he fulfilled all the righteousness of the law. Because no one's ever been made right by following the law. Romans 8.20 said that. No one's ever been made right by following the law. Romans 8.20. But they were like, well, he didn't, he didn't destroy it. He fulfilled it. So if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to fulfill it too. And then we'll be saved. No. We need to fulfill it, obviously, to be like Jesus. But that doesn't save us or unsave us. What saves us or unsaves us is accepting that gift accepting the substitution that he did on the cross. So it says, So the apostles and elders met together to resolve the issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, now don't notice that, they had a long discussion. This wasn't two guys sitting in a room deciding something that ended up coming out and declaring what's true. Back in their time, open dialogue and discussing things was okay. Did you know that if you disagree with me, that's okay? If you disagree with me, I'd like to hear it. 
It will either strengthen my position or modify my position or completely change my position. But no one has the authority to lord it over somebody else and tell them this is the way it is. So they were all talking. And Peter stood up in the middle of them all talking. He says, after the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so they would hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. If you're a Bible underliner, underline that. He cleansed their heart through faith. He went to the house of Cornelius, and they didn't have to get, he didn't circumcise them all and then they got saved. He preached the gospel to them. They ascended to it. Like in the middle of when he's talking to them about Jesus Christ and the gospel, they all simultaneously believed without saying a word. No sinner's prayer, no formulas. They just accepted that Jesus had forgiven them of their sins. They were instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, God is the one who put a stamp of approval on this. This isn't something we all decided in a room. I preached the gospel, and God showed that he accepts Gentiles without circumcision by filling with the Holy Spirit instantly. Verse 9, for he made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with the yoke that neither we nor our ancestors could bear? He's like, why are you trying to put on them the law which we couldn't obey? Why are you doing that? We believe that we are saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. The undeserved grace. I told you last week, grace is like gravy, like the cherry on top, like extra, extra. This is undeserved. You can't earn the favor of God. You can never do anything to make God love you anymore. Did you know that? And you can't do anything to make God love you any less. God is love. He is perfect in his love. He is unwavering in his love. If you accept Christ as your Savior, you are perfect in God's eyes. People say, oh, you shouldn't teach that. Huh? People just go out and sin after that. You are perfect in God's eyes if you've accepted him. He saved you. He loves you. And from that relationship, you grow. From that relationship, you say, well, what if I go out and sin? Well, sin has consequences, doesn't it? Sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. Things don't become bad because God forbids them. Did you know that? He forbids them because they're already bad. When God said, don't kill people, they said, oh, well, heck, killing people was a good idea, but since God said not to do it, it's wrong now. No, it's wrong to kill people. That's why God forbids it. Everything God forbids is for your own good. Did you know that? You would, if you were as wise as God, you'd spell the Ten Commandments. If you were, you would decree everything here if you were God. Because God has perfect knowledge and he loves us perfectly. And he puts his commands down to protect us. Not to restrain us. People say, well, you know that whole thing about sex before you're married. You know, I think we know better than that nowadays. Oh yeah, really? Look at the stats. Look at look at the carnage of our society since we decided to go, we know better than God. We'll do what if you just love each other, that's really all that you need. No. Look at the mess we've made of it. God said not to do that because it's not good for you. It's bad for society. It says everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So that's verse 12. They preach the gospel, people receive Christ, and the miracles come to prove that the message is true. When they had finished speaking, that's Peter, it says, when they finished, James stood and said, and James is the half-brother of Jesus here. He said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of the Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. So what he's saying is, this isn't something new outside the Old Testament. 
This is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. God always had a plan to save the Gentiles. So Christianity and people getting saved outside of Judaism is not a new thing. This has always been predicted. So in like Amos, it says afterward, in verse 16, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all I have called to mind. The Lord has spoken. He has made these things known so long ago. So long ago, God predicted that through the Jews, that they would be salt, light, and city on the hill. And then so people around the world would go, what's going on with the God of the Israelites? What's going on with the God of the Jews? How are they so different? Why is that nation so bright? Why is that nation so exalted? Well, the same thing has happened to us now. As the Gentiles, God says that we would do good works, that they would glorify our Father in heaven. The Christians would be a light in the world, and salt in the world, and a city on a hill. That's always been God's plan, so that no one is too lost. No one is too far gone. So, it says, in 19, it says, And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating foods offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Then the apostles and the elders put the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates, and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. These men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. This is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It's written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia. Readings. We understand that some men here from here, have troubled you and upset you with their teaching. But we did not send them. So we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you the official representative, along with our beloved Barnabas and Saul, who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or meat to the strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you do well. Farewell. So the conclusion of their meeting is to say that yes, it's only Christ alone that saves, and there's nothing else required for salvation. No circumcision required. I'm sure the men were like, thank you very much. <laughs> But the idea of needing something else, and, but they added these rules here. They had rules of no eating food off of idols, no um, meat that is blood or, blood or meat that is strangled, and from sexual immorality. What do you think, and he says, but he says, if you do this, you do well. There's nothing to do with salvation, these rules. What these rules have to do with is sensitivity to the culture around you. So, meat offered to idols, back in the day, they would have these temples to the gods. And the Gentiles would be saved out of these temples to the gods, but yet, if you went to worship one of these gods, you would take an animal. They'd slaughter the animal, and what was left over, you got to keep. And so they'd take the, the food and they would put it in the markets. So they slaughter the animal, butcher it, and then the meat's left over, so they put it in the local shops, right? Mm -hmm. So you could go to the shop and say, oh, look, there's some great tea books. They're really cheap. Mm -hmm. But they've been offered to an idol. Well, now, in 1 Corinthians, Paul said it doesn't really matter because those things are fake. You know, like, if you offered some meat to an idol, something you made up, and then you served me the steak, I'd be like, steak's good. I think your idol's worthless, but I don't care. It's just meat, right? But what if you had been involved in that kind of worship? That would offend your conscience, wouldn't it? Because you're doing the same old thing. You're involved. The thing about meat, strangled, and the blood of meat, that's kosher. 
So the Jewish people would be offended by meat that wasn't prepared properly. Gentiles would be offended by meat that was offered to idols. He says, stay away from that. Why? Because it'll stumble your brother. It'll mess up the guy next to you. In fornication, he had to put that specifically in place because there's nothing I've ever seen in all of Christianity which, is, which needs to be stated more clearly. Because there'll be strong Christians who be like, oh, we're not really, what does fornication mean? What does sexual immorality mean? What is it really? I mean, we're married in the eyes of God. No. All sex outside of marriage is wrong. It's wrong. There's no getting around it. And some people say, well, we're married in the eyes of God. I'll give you a quick story. Woman at the well, right? Jesus talks to her. What does he say to her? He says, you've been married four times before, and the one you're with now, you're not even married to. So did Jesus see a difference between marriage and not marriage? Yeah. Just living with somebody? And if, and if sleeping with somebody makes you married to them, then, then why does it use different words for adultery and fornication? So we would say, well, what is exactly fornication? It's any sexual activity outside of marriage. Period. So he has to tell everyone that because everyone gets real fast and loose with it. Because you need to be married to enjoy the sex that God has created that is good. God's not anti-sex. He, he made it pleasurable. He made it good. He blessed it within the marriage. It's fine. Outside of the marriage, it's a bloody mess out there. So he's saying, don't. So he wants us to be different than the world. He wants us to be sensitive to the Jews and sensitive to the Gentiles. If you divide up the world like Jews, Gentiles, is there any other category? No. That makes sense to everybody, right? I'm going to wade into this very carefully. Because I know that I'll probably offend some people. But when you're... I'll pick on young men because I used to be one. I'm not young anymore. <laughs> A young man who's about 18, 19 years old, 16, 17, thinks that if he's got the truth, he can say it any way he wants to. I don't care who it hurts. It's the truth. That's my viewpoint. There it is. That's truth. Deal with it. If I hurt your feelings, tough luck. That's not spiritual maturity. That's not the Bible. The Bible is very clear. In Romans, 8, or in Romans 12, verse 18, it says, As much as it is all possible within you, dwell at peace with all men. Does that mean telling everybody the truth? Just the whole truth and nothing but the truth? No. In Romans 14, it says, Don't stumble your brother by the freedoms that you have. And there's a whole, a whole chapter on that. All of Romans 14 is about how we have liberty as Christians. I have the liberty to do certain things that you don't. You have the liberty to do certain things I don't. I'm not talking about what's black and white in the Bible. I'm talking about areas of choice. What you decide to do. Things that are, uh, what movies you watch. What music you listen to. What people you hang out with. Vacations you take. I just there's just a myriad of things out there that you have a personal choice about. Don't let your freedoms and your liberty stumble your brother. Paul said regarding me, he said, I would not eat, eat any meat at all if it stumbled my brother. Knowing full well that there were people out there that eating meat, that bothered them. So he's careful about the way he exercises his own personal liberties. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, that we're to do nothing out of pride and selfishness, and that we're to think of others as better than ourselves. That's a tough verse to swallow, isn't it? That means I, I want to make sure that you are not stumbled and that you grow and that you are encouraged without regards to my personal freedoms, my personal points of view. So that Christianity isn't marred by being culturally insensitive, but by being inclusive of other people, and by listening to them, and by 
finding common ground with them. Um, a verse that really encapsulates this to me, this is kind of Paul's philosophy on this whole thing when it comes to law and freedom. And I think this verse says it better than I could. He says, even though, and this is 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. He says, even though I am a free man with no master, I become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. So I'm a free man. I can do what I want to. God's made me free. I can, I can make my own decisions before the Lord, but I become a slave to all men so that I can win some, or win many. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I, when I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I lived under the law, even though I'm not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who were under the law. When I was with the Gentiles, who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law, so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I ought to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save them. What would you call a guy like that? Wishy-washy? Two-faced? Because when he's with the people who are under the law, he practiced this in the law so he can tell, share Christ with them. In other words, he doesn't go to India and eat hamburgers when he's trying to witness to the people in India. Because they think cows are sacred. Well, cows are not sacred. They're delicious. <laughs> I can attest to that. I love myself a good cheeseburger or steak. But I don't eat the cheeseburger and steak when I'm trying to spread the gospel with a vegetarian, right? I'm limiting myself for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I'm with the people who eat the burgers, I eat the burgers. Why? So I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because my personal preferences take second place to my right standing. I'm right. I have it all figured out. And I'm just going to be who I am in front of everybody, and I don't care who it affects. That's immature. That, that takes no wisdom. It takes no self-control. It takes no Holy Spirit. I am what I am, and that's, what it is. that's how it is. That's very immature. He says, yes, I find common ground with everyone. What do you think everyone means there in the Greek? Everyone. Everyone. Doing everything I can to save something. That means dropping your stuff at the door and say, how can I minister to this person? How can I find common ground with them? Not how can I straighten them out? How can I show them where they're wrong? And I'm afraid that that's what our society through social media has really whipped up. Let's, let's really get these gotcha things and show people how they're wrong. And in your face. When I was a young minister in the jail, I used to go in there and preach the gospel. Every now and then I'd get in arguments with people. I walk out of there saying, I won that argument, I showed them. <laughs> Next time I go to Bible study, there's half the people there. Why? Because the jerk with the Bible just acted like a jerk. And he won, but he lost the souls. All things to all people so that I can win the son. That's the heart of the gospel. It says, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share this blessing. Don't you realize that in a, in a race, everyone want, runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with a purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I am disciplined my body like an athlete, training me to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So his whole thing with, you know, they start out, I love the controversy that these guys came in and said, yeah, I need to be circumcised. And say, why do I love it? So they could put it down in black and white. Nope. That's not the case. Here, we're going we're gonna to write a letter. You can just distribute this to everybody around. No, that's not the case. 
But, in the same sense, be sensitive to the culture around you. Jews and Gentiles, and avoid fornication. Why? Because if, if we're fornicating as Christians, we're showing the world that we're no different than they are. They were willing to bend any rule, do whatever we want to, and as clear as can be. So, let's move on. It says, The messengers went at once to Antioch, where they were called the general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judas and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. They stayed for a while, and then the believers sent back to the church to Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord there. So, they go back to Antioch and they say, here's the news, here's the letter, here's how it is. Wow. Great. And they live happily ever after. <laughs> nope. Next verse, 36. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly. Since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and not continued with them in their work, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and so the Cyprus. Paul chose Silas as he left, and the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. So these two guys, I mean, they have a long history. Paul was the one who, I mean, Barnabas was the one who took Paul in Jerusalem and said, hey, you don't have to be afraid of him. He's one of us now. Because Saul had went around killing all these Christians and having them in prison. And the people in Jerusalem were like, we're not talking to him. And Barnabas was like, no, no, he's good, he's good. So Barnabas vouched for Paul first in Jerusalem. Then when things got cooking in Antioch, ten years later, he went and got Paul and brought him to Antioch so that he could minister to the people. Then Barnabas and Paul took a, a charity gift to Jerusalem together to help out the mother church. Then they went on the first missionary journey together. Then they went to the Council of Jerusalem together and brought back this good news. Now Paul probably wants to take this letter around to all the churches that they started in their first missionary journey, make sure everyone's good, we're all, we're all good on grace, we're all, you know, it's only Jesus, that's it. And Barnabas goes, great idea, we'll take John Mark too, and Paul says, no way. And Barnabas says, yes, buddy. <laughs> so they had no small disagreement, which means they had a large disagreement. Now here's where people go, Barnabas was wrong to think out of them on their first missionary journey. I'll tell you something, the Bible doesn't say that. And John Mark wrote the book of Mark. He also was like a son to Peter. He also later on helped out Paul. Paul was like, we're not taking that guy along. We have the gospel, and you know, the gospel is more important than individual problems. It's more important than, we've got to have people we can rely on. This is going to be a tough journey. God's showing me that. We're not taking that guy. I have no problem with that. Barnabas said, wait a minute, Paul. It's not the message. It's about people. We're, we're raising a minister here. What are we going to do? Paul, you wouldn't even be here if it weren't for me. I vouched for you in Jerusalem. I brought you to Antioch. I mean, can't you trust me on this? Let's bring John Mark. He wasn't wrong. You know what we got out of this? Two missionary teams. And I'm not saying any of them are wrong. Did you know that Christians can disagree with each other? <laughs> That's, that, well, we know that for sure. If you don't believe it, talk to me afterwards. I'll disagree with you. <laughs> the question is, are you going to disagree agreeably? As we get ready to pass out communion here and have communion, this is about the body of Christ. And the body of Christ has room for disagreement. Christians can be wrong. When you come into church, don't make deal. The, the mistake of thinking everyone around you is just peachy keen. Some of them have wrong doctrine. Did you know that? 
Well, I can't believe that. Well, find a church that there isn't somebody that doesn't have wrong doctrine. Find a church that's perfect. And when you do, don't attend it, because I know what will happen when you go there. <laughs> it won't be perfect anymore. The church is full of people. And people are messed up. And people are different stages of growth. People are different states of mind. And so you can't trust on your neighbor to always be 100% perfect. This is what you can count on, that in the book of Acts, they spread the gospel using churches. They established churches everywhere they went. The second missionary journey was about reestablishing and establishing the churches that they started. The church is the body of Christ. It's the way he operates here on earth. If you're involved in other organizations, I, I said it to the Gideons this morning as we talked about and visited, is that um, to the extent the Gideons are a wonderful organization because they incorporate the church. You can't be a Gideon without being a church member. And, and all the church organizations out there besides the church, the more they operate like a church, the less friction they have. The closer they operate with the church, the less friction they have. If they operate outside the church and they don't operate like a church, that's the extent that they'll have friction. Because God's vehicle to spread the gospel and to grow up Christians is the church. He calls it his body. He calls it his bride. He calls it his temple. And he calls it his treasure. Jesus is pretty big on the church. You see here in Acts, they're spreading the gospel of the church. In Romans, he defines the gospel of the church. All the rest of the books are two churches. There is no chapter or verse in the Bible to tell you how to live your Christian life outside of church. Did you know that? It's all within the context of church. It doesn't say, well, if you want to be a Rambo, here's 1 Rambo 917. No, we don't have that. That's, that's a, along with the other books of the Bible like Fleshalonians. And... There, are no other, there are no other books in the Bible. So church is a necessity. And the church can become corrupted. Do you know that? You know how you find out when the church is when you find out when the church is corrupted? You go to the church leadership and you say, This is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. Why? Because the Bible says so. If they won't listen to you, you know what you do? You find the next best church you can find. Because every church is going to have flaws. And I have people say, Well, I've been burned by church. Well, I've burned by I've been burned by fire before. Did you know that? And gasoline. I've been burned by gasoline. I still use gasoline. I've been shocked by electricity. Quite recently, actually. <laughs> you know what? I still use electricity. I have, a, I have cars. They break down. I still drive cars. I don't walk. The idea that, oh, well, church burned me one time. I'm never going to church again. That doesn't work anywhere else in the world. I've had really bad jobs. You know what? If I don't have a job, I'm going to starve. So I pick the best job I can. You pick the best church you can. It's not optional for a healthy Christian. It's not optional for kingdom work. It's 100% essential. You're going to have problems because of people. But I want to read one song for you here as we finish up. Psalm 73. You get out in the world and you can say, why do the wicked prosper and why do I have it so bad? Did you ever feel like that? Like I'm trying to be a good person, but the bad people always win. And the good people always lose. What's going on, God? This is my favorite psalm for this. It's called the Psalm of Asaph. I'm just reading a portion out of it. The whole chapter is good. But it says in verse 73, chapter 73, verse 12. Look at these wicked people, enjoying the life of ease, while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning I wake up in pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I try to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. Then, I went into your sanctuary. Finally understood the destiny of the wicked. It doesn't make sense to get back in here. This is our sanctuary. 
we always say, don't run in the sanctuary. I love that. And I'll see you in the foyer. But that ends up. We call it words in church, I just think are hilarious. I've never used the word minced except for in church. In our minced. Um, but this is a sanctuary, right? And we say it in that sanctimonious way, but really this is a sanctuary. What's a bird sanctuary? A place where birds are safe and they don't get shot. This is a sanctuary. This is where we come to recharge our batteries. This is where we come to renew, to reset, to refocus, to calibrate. And there's no better people to practice your Christianity on than the people around you. Because they have the grace. God gives us the grace to forgive each other when we're, when we're clumsy and immature. If you have wise people around you, they'll tell you when you're messed up. You know, they'll tell you when you're being a kook. Like, well, that's really interesting. I'm glad you learned that about Christ, but please don't repeat that in public. You sound like a weirdo. <laughs> that happens sometimes. We get in our little clicks and we're like, oh, wow. And you come into church, we're like, no, don't do that. So the church brings us, makes us whole and wholesome. As we, as we take the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the body, so this is my body which is broken for you. And he calls us his body. This is for our unity. This is for our cleansing. The body is what we practice every day in, in growing us in, in Christ, encouraging one another, growing together in the Lord, all under the basis of we're forgiven because of what Jesus did outside of all that. So let's take lead. This is my body which is broken for you. Do in remembrance of me. He says, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As the music team comes up, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your body and your blood. Thank you for loving us, being a part of your body. And thank you for the blood you shed. We know that this is a precious thing, a precious time, and, and you said it. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And remember what you did. And if there's anything we've done, Lord, that comes between us and you in our relationship, we ask forgiveness. And I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to the people around us. To put aside our own pride and our own immaturity and reach the lost that has been talked about today. To evangelize the world with your gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.